13.7 billion years ago, our universe was condensed into one giant egg. Inside of this egg was filled with void and darkness. Inside of the void and the darkness, life was about to begin. Inside of this egg contained the ancestor to all human life. He goes by the name of Pangu, who has been in hibernation for over 18,000 years now. And when Pangu wanted to move his body, he was squished tightly by the egg, and he couldn't move an inch until he found an axe right beside him. So, Pangu he picked up the axe, and with one swing of the axe, the world around him was split into the heaven and the earth. The darkness around him disappeared. It was replaced with the warmth of the light. He was still worried uh, that the heaven and earth would close up one day. So, he opened up his arms and both of his feet. With each passing day, he pushed the heavens higher into the sky, and he pushed the earth deeper into the ground, until he had no more energy left to give, and he finally drew his last breath. His left eye would become the sun, his right eye would become the moon, his hair became the stars in the sky. Pangu, it's now one with the force. Now the world that Pangu created was void of life, until Empress Nuwa appeared from the heavens. She has the face of a woman, but the body of a snake and she can shapeshift for over 70 times a day. As Empress Nuwa walked by the beach, she picked up some mud and sand. With one magical breath, the mud came to life. However, this process of creating humans one at a time was too slow. So she picked up some branches in the forest and dipped them in mud. She whipped the branches around and humans appeared all over the place. In order to ensure humanity's uh, survival, Empress Nuwa, she created the gender binary giving half of the people yang qi, assigning them the male gender, and giving the other half yin qi, assigning them to the female gender, and making marriages between a man and a woman. Fast forward to roughly 4200 years ago. Now Mr. Yao, he was a great leader in the ancient Chinese tribe. He would rule the tribe for over 70 years. And uh, when Yao, he wanted to retire and pass on the throne, he was worried because his son was a very lazy and unmotivated. He's not fit to be a leader. His son doesn't care about the people. So uh, when Mr. Yao, he asked uh, for advice from the local officials. They recommended a man called uh, Yu Shun. Yao was motivated by uh, Yu's uh, work ethic, honesty, and kindness. So Mr. Yao, he decided to marry both of his daughters to Mr. Yu, and he will pass his power on to him. Now, Mr. Yu, his father is blind and he was abused by his mother often. But uh, he never once complained about anything in life. Wherever he traveled to, civilizations flourished. His motto was always to put the people first, and use kindness to treat people. Under Yu's uh, early days as leader, flooding from the Yellow River and the Yangtze River was frequent, destroying people's homes, their crops, and their livelihoods. Life was almost impossible. Yu, he made many uh, attempts to control the flooding, but uh, all in vain. So uh, Mr. Yu, he made a decision. He fired the, the previous officials that was put in charge of uh, trying to control the flooding and uh, he would hire his son to take charge. Now his son Yu, he learned lessons from his fathers. After studying the landscapes around the rivers, he invented an irrigation system that would lead the water to the open sea. This irrigation system took 13 years to complete and the flooding was finally under control in ancient China. Life and civilizations began to flourish. This man would become Yu the Great, and he established the, the very first dynasty of China. This is the Xia Dynasty. By the way, Xia means summer in Chinese. We're at uh, 2070 BCE. The entire Xia Dynasty is still considered to be possibly mythical, even to present day, because the Chinese text has yet to be invented. In fact, it wouldn't be invented for at least another thousand years. So everything was told by uh, word of mouth. So some time had passed, Yu the Great, he got old and he died, and it was time to pass on his powers. A massive power struggle broke out with his son Qi and Bo Yi. Bo Yi was a hero during the construction of the irrigation system, so naturally he was chosen to be the successor. But uh, despite all of this, Yu's other son Qi still wanted to uh, rule over China. So a general named uh, Hu Shi, he entered the battlefield with Qi. Qi would be victorious in battle. In fact, he would go on to win many more battles. And he became a very famous wartime general, enslaving the defeated, and uh, he formed his own haram. Yes, Americans. Slavery has been happening since the beginning of time. The strong has always enslaved the poor. 
Chinese people enslaved Chinese people. White people enslaved white people. Black people enslaved black people. So, uh, from Yu the Great, his son Qi would become China's very first uh, dictator. He was given the title of Xia Qi. The Xia Dynasty lasted for over 400 years until a corrupt emperor Xia Jie took power. He was extremely lazy, fat, violent, and he killed innocent civilians just for fun. He spent most of his time goofing around and sleeping with women. A massive rebellion took place, led by uh, General Shang Tang. He spent many years building his forces and wiping out uh, small Xia Dynasty armies before finally reaching the capital, decapitating the Xia Dynasty. And the new Shang Dynasty is born. During the uh, late Shang Dynasty period, Emperor Shangzhou Wang was totally incompetent, letting the country rot away. So, a man named uh, Ji Chang, he saw a weakened empire and uh, sought out people to support him for an uprising. However, Ji passed away before his planned rebellion, so his son Ji Fa took power. A few years later, Emperor Shang became a Joseph Stalin-like dictator. Ji Fa finally decided it was time to gather an army of 50,000 men to battle. His army was met with uh, 170,000 Shang Dynasty soldiers outside of the capital. Outnumbered, Ji Fa came out victorious. When Shang Zhou Wang was faced with defeat, he burned himself while wearing all of his gold and jewelry. The Shang Dynasty is toppled. The Xi Zhou Dynasty is born. Some time would pass until Zhou Li Wang was an extremely corrupt emperor, taking everything away from his citizens and murdering innocent civilians. He would cut off the tongues of any peasants that spoke against him. The peasants couldn't bear the torture any longer, and they staged a coup in 841 BC. The Zhou Emperor fled the royal palace. Zhou Li Wang would die while in exile. Zhou Xuan Wang is the new emperor. A few generations later, another drunk, horny, and corrupt emperor took power. His name is Zhou Yu Wang. He was addicted to sleeping around with women. His favorite concubine was named uh, Bao Si. He never saw her smile once. So he decided to uh, take her to the guard towers to light up the flares, and uh, he finally saw her smile. Now, these flare signals are meant to uh, alert the troops for enemies, but the corrupt emperor, he would just lit it for fun for so many times. It got to the point where the soldiers all got annoyed and they ignored the signals over time, until a real invasion came from General Quan Rong. The guards lit up the flares to alert the troops, but everybody ignored them. The invasion was an easy one. The army was brutally murdered, and the Xizhou dynasty was no more. The fall of the Xizhou dynasty marked the beginning of the era of chaos in China. This is known as the Chunqiu Zhangguo, the Spring Autumn War Country. The son of the former emperor, Zhou Pingwang, fled to Luoyang in the Shandong province. Qi Guo is established. North of Qi Guo, it's Yan Guo. In uh, 664 BC, the small Yan Guo was invaded by Shan Rong. Yan Guo asked uh, Qi Guo for help. The nations Yan and Qi would join forces for a counter-offensive, defeating Shan Rong. Shan Rong would flee to Guizhou Guo. Battle ensues. The Qi Guo forces is lost in the desert, but thanks to their veteran horses, they marched out of the desert, and Qi Huan Gong would defeat all remnant enemy forces to become the first ruler of the Spring-Autumn War period. Qi Huan Gong surely dies after becoming the ruler. After Qi Huan Gong's death, Song Xiang Gong wants to seize power. He will go on to attack Zheng Guo. Zheng Guo would see help from Chu Guo. Chu Guo then goes on to attack Song Guo. Chu and Song's forces they met on opposite sides of the river. Song Guo's advisors told him to attack while uh, the Chu Guo troops are crossing the river. The Song general refused because uh, he wants Chu to get information after crossing the river and then crush his forces because he desired total victory. But uh, this plan obviously backfired. The Song Guo troops is defeated, and their emperor will suffer life-threatening injuries. He would die less than one year later. In another part of China, Jin Guo was becoming a superpower, and aimed to wipe out two smaller nations of Guo and Yu, knowing that uh, crushing the two-nation alliance would be extremely difficult. So Jin decided to bribe the Yu nation by offering a champion horse and the jade treasure box, along with gold and silver. The emperor of Yu was blindsided by the treasure and agreed to attack Guo. Despite many of his advisors warning him that Guo and Yu are like mouth and teeth, without the mouth, the teeth will freeze. The emperor ignored the warning signs and uh, decided to attack Yu. But uh, on his way back, Jin would turn on Guo and crush the smaller nation, taking back all of their treasures, killing two birds with one stone. 
Just like that, the smaller nations of Guo and Yu are no more, both conquered by Jin. After Jin's victory, hundreds of people from the Yu family became prisoners. To embarrass the Yu family, Qin sent uh, Yu and his daughter to Thailand to an arranged marriage. Yu fled to the modern-day Henan province, but was captured. After Jin Xiangong's death, the nation falls into chaos. Yi Wu saw a weakened nation and attempted to seize power by murdering Jin's son, Yi Wu, and Chong Er. Chong Er would be forced into exile. Chong would live in the nation of Di for 12 years. After constant assassination attempts, he was forced to flee once again to the kingdom of Wei, but he was rejected. Eventually, he would arrive in the kingdom of Qi, and he was welcomed by Qi Huanggong. Chong's advisors were strongly against his decision, wanting him to return to rule over China. So they got him drunk one night, put him in a horse carriage, and together they left the kingdom of Qi in a horse carriage. In 636 BC, after 19 years in exile, Chong came back as the ruler of the Jin dynasty at the age of 62. While in exile, Chong he made a promise to the nation of Chu that in order to uh, thank Chu for their aid during his exile, if war between Chu and Jin takes place, he will order all of his troops to back 15 kilometers to show respect. When war broke out in 632 BC, he delivered on his promise and backed off 45 kilometers. The Chu forces thought of this as an act of cowardice and panic. So when Chu advanced at full force, they fell right into the ambush of Jin, resulting in complete encirclement, and the Chu kingdom would fall. China is now united as the Jin dynasty. 628 BC, Jin Wengong passes away from illness. His son Xianggong is named the emperor of Jin. War breaks out between Qin and Zheng. A general named Xian Gao from Zheng met with Qin's forces and offered a gift of 12 bowls and 12 sheets of bowl skin. General Meng Ming from the Qin's forces accepted this gift and retreated. Xian Gao was a trader trying to sell his livestock to foreign nations. When he realized the kingdom of Zheng was under attack, he only met uh, the Qin forces by chance and changed his story in order to bribe them. After returning to Zheng, he fabricated his story on how his plan saved the kingdom of Zheng. And because of this, he became a national hero. In 627 BC, Qin would annihilate the smaller nation of Hua. But on their way back, the Jin Kingdom's forces ambushed Qin and captured three of their top generals. But uh, for some odd reason, these three top generals, they would be allowed to return to Qin. In 624 BC, the kingdom of Qin would launch a counterattack led by General Meng at 500 carriers. The Qin forces advanced rapidly through the Yellow River, burning their boats after crossing, showing their determination of never turning back. All lost territories would be returned to the Qin Kingdom during this counterattack. The Qin forces would retrieve all the dead skeletons from their ambush a few years back, and buried all of their dead comrades, helping them find peace in the afterlife. Let's fast forward in time. It is now 494 BC. The nations Yue and the Wu goes into war in northeastern China. Yue is defeated. And Emperor Yue became his slave, and he was forced to uh, take care of horses for three years. After his release, he vowed revenge every single day. He slept on a bed of uh, hay every single night to remember his time as a slave. After training and assembling the best army in the nation, between the years of uh, 482 and 473 BC, Yue would twice attack Wu, and wiping the nation of Wu off the map altogether, Yue would become the final ruler during the uh, spring-autumn period. It is now 455 BC. Jin is now controlled by four families. The Zhi, Zhao, Han, and Wei. Zhi, being the most powerful, offered the other three families 50 kilometers of land in exchange for Zhi to rule over the Jin dynasty. Everyone agreed, except for the family of Zhao. Because of this, the other three families would go into war with Zhao. After two years, Zhao would hold his base in Jinyang. Han and Wei are now discussing a plan in order to flood the city by building a dam and breaking it during the rain season. A spy from Zhao's family would find out about this plan, and in an extraordinary twist of fate, the Zhao, Han, Wei forces would now join power to take on the Zhi. Caught by surprise, Zhi's forces are completely wiped out. In the year 403 BC, Han, Zhao, Wei joined forces and became the new Zhu Hao Guo. The event became known as Three Families Splitting Jin. In 353 BC, 
Wei invades Zhao with forces of 80,000 men. Qi would take this chance to attack Wei's capital, seeing all of uh, Wei's forces are away in battle. And just like that, the Wei forces were crushed. In 342 BC, Wei would attack the nation of Han. Qi came to Han's aid with the same tactic. Wei would be completely encircled this time. General Pang was hit by arrows and committed suicide. This event marked the official fall of Wei and the rise of Qi. 284 BC, Yang Zhou Wang attacks the nation of Qi. The battle came to a halt for the next three years. Yang Zhou Wang then passes away, leaving his son Yang Hui Wang in charge of the battle. The Qi nation used the insane tactic of using 1,000 bulls, dressing them with red capes and attaching blades to their horns. Also 5,000 elite troops dressed like ghosts in order to scare the enemies. As midnight approached, the bull's tail is set on fire to set them into a rage and frenzy mode. This tactic worked as tens of thousands of enemy Yan troops are gored and stumped to death. Their counterattack would regain all of their lost territories. It was around this time period a six nation alliance is formed with Su Qin named leader of the pact. 313 BC, the pact falls apart due to constant spying and distrust between the nations. Qi forms an alliance with Qin to attack Chu. Chu is forced to give up two cities in order to save their kingdom. Around this time period, the nation of Zhao would rise to rival Qin. Northern China would be unified eventually by Zhao in 305 BC. In 262 BC, Qin goes to war with Zhao. The battle would enter stalemate for two years, until in 260 BC, Qin forces encircled Zhao and was able to cut off their food supply for over 40 days. Zhao's forces made one last desperate attempt to break out. Qin would launch 10,000 arrows at them, killing their leader Zhao Kuo. Over 400,000 Zhao troops are wiped out in one of the most barbaric battles in Chinese history. The remaining Zhao forces went to the kingdom of Chu to ask for aid. After much convincing, Chu would come to the aid of Zhao, forcing Qin to retreat for the time being and saving the kingdom of Zhao. However, this would not last long. In 229 BC, Qin would attack once again, this time wiping the kingdom of Zhao completely off the map. The Qin forces have now arrived at the border of the Yan kingdom. The Yan troops know that uh, there's no chance for them to win this war, so they hired an assassin named Jin Ke in order to kill the Qin emperor. He was given one pocket knife and one vial of poison. Jin Ke, he made up lies about uh, giving maps and inside information about the Yan kingdom in order to set up a meeting with the Qin emperor. Upon meeting him, Jin Ke pulled out his knife and the emperor reacted quickly. The first swing was able to only cut the Qin emperor's sleeve. Jin would go on to chase the emperor inside the royal palace in circles until the Qin emperor reached for his blade and Jin's left leg was cut in half. Jin would throw his blade in his final act of desperation, but the knife would end up hitting a post. Jin Ke would spend his final moments sitting, laughing and cursing at the emperor while bleeding out before finally being executed. And we have arrived at the year of 221 BC. Emperor Qin Shi Huang is widely considered to be the first person to truly unite China. As I mentioned before, Yu the Great might be mythical. The Six Nation Alliance of Han, Yan, Wei, Chu, Qi would all be crushed by Qin Shi Huang. By the way, Qin Shi Huang was 4 foot 11 or uh, 150 centimeters tall. So there's still hope for you to get a girlfriend and conquer a nation one day. However, Qin Shi Huang would turn into a ruthless dictator. In 213 BC, Qin Shi Huang ordered all books inside of China to be burned to ashes with some minor exceptions such as medical books. So just like that, tens and thousands of Chinese literature is lost forever. Any mentioning of any past books would result in you and your entire family being tortured and executed. This marked the end of the golden age of Chinese literature, very similar to uh, the siege of Baghdad, which marked the end of the uh, Islamic golden age. Over 400 talented scholars who wanted to uh, preserve their life's work would be buried and gassed alive. This event is known today as Fen Shu Keng Ru. It roughly translates to uh, slaves of the uh, burning book pit. So after the burning of the books, Qin Shi Huang ordered uh, the construction of the Great Wall. This was done uh, by mostly using slaves. Slavery has been happening since the beginning of time. It happened worldwide. Tens and thousands of people 
died during the construction, the Great Wall of China would eventually expand to over 6,300 kilometers, or just under 4,000 miles, with multiple sections to keep out invaders. Qin Shi Huang would soon kick the bucket, and his son Qin Er Shi was just as ruthless as his father. So in 209 BC, two peasants, Chen Sheng and Wu Guang, killed two top generals. They rallied the poor peasants in order to stage a coup. Their army had no weapons, and they fought with sticks and stones. The battle ensued was absolutely brutal, in every way, shape, and form possible, with the rebels gaining support from remnants of the uh, fallen Six Nation Alliance. In the city of uh, Zhu Lu, Chu's forces entered battle nine times with the Qin forces, yes, a total of nine times, eventually achieving victory. In the meantime, the Qin Dynasty is now under the sole control of Zhao Gao. He forced uh, Qin Er Shi to kill himself, and Qin Er Shi's son Zi Ying does not want to be a puppet ruler, so he killed Zhao Gao. At this time, the Qin Dynasty has weakened so much, their 50,000 troops guarding the capital would be easily defeated by the rebel forces. Qin would capitulate to rebel Liu Bang. The mighty Qin Dynasty would be brought down by a rebellion started by a bunch of poor peasant farmers. After achieving victory, book writing is once again legalized. All Qin era laws are abolished. Three new laws would come into effect. Number one, taking a life means death sentence. Number two, physical assault is a crime. Number three, theft is a crime. In 206 BC, a man named Xiang Yu, he's not happy with uh, Liu Bang being the leader of the new China. China would enter the Chu Han War. After four years of deadly battle, Xiang Yu is cornered with his final battalion, and he made one final suicidal charge, killing hundreds of troops while being stabbed dozens of times, eventually cutting his own throat. After the victory, Liu Bang would establish the Han Dynasty and name the city of Luoyang its capital, earning himself a title of Han Gaozu. It is during the Han Dynasty, the practice of using eunuchs in the imperial haram became extremely popular. Castration is now a common punishment, and it is also used as a battle tactic in order to uh, lower enemy morale. It is now 200 BC. Liu Bang goes to war with 400,000 Xiongnu troops, and Liu Bang was trapped for 7 days and 7 nights. He was able to narrowly escape by using gold to bribe the enemy. To counter this uh, Xiongnu threat, many uh, marriages uh, were arranged between the two sides in exchange for uh, decades of peace on both sides. In 195 BC, Liu Bang leads the army to wipe out his underling, who were plotting a coup against him. Liu comes out victorious, but was struck by an arrow. He would die shortly after. After Liu's death, one of his uh, son's concubines, Lu Ho, would make the Liu family puppet emperors, seizing power, eliminating all opposition, promoting everyone in her family to power, killing countless Liu family members. She controlled China in the shadows until her death. In 154 BC, China once again erupts into an all-out war. This would become known as the War of the Seven Nations. Things get extremely complicated. For obvious reasons, you have seven nations going at war with each other. But eventually, the Han Dynasty would still prevail for now. 123 BC, the Xiongnu would attempt to invade China once again. The war would last for four years until the Han troops of 50,000 men were split into two forces, and they chased the Xiongnu for over 1,000 kilometers deep into the harsh desert conditions. The Xiongnu forces is forced to retreat north, finally putting to an end to the conflict. It is now 9 BC. Wang Mang becomes the new emperor, a true tyrant. He increased taxes, taking away land and food from the poor peasants, and then wants to go to war with the Xiongnu again. In the year 17 AD, Southern China experiences a massive famine. A pair of farmers, led by Wang Kuang and Wang Feng, staged a rebellion against the rich. They would form the Lu Lin Jun, the Green Forest Army. Another group named the Chi Mei Jun, the Red Eyebrows Army. Yes, they literally dyed their eyebrows red. The two armies would go and join forces in order to topple the current dictator regime that has led to this massive famine and poverty throughout the country. Things get crazy once again. In the end, both the Green Forest and the uh, Red Eyebrows forces would be defeated in the year of 25 AD by Emperor Guangwu Di. In the following decades, the Han Dynasty uh, would go on many more wars, including war with the Xiongnu once again in the year of 73 AD, conquering many smaller nations along the way. In 184 AD, Han Ling, 
the new emperor of China, is extremely corrupt, and he lets his underlings run the nation to the ground, never batting an eye to the political situation. The peasants were tired of the suffering and staged the Yellow Turban Rebellion, led by the three John brothers. Government buildings were burned down, prisoners were set free, food storage centers were raided, troops were being attacked. The rebellion would eventually be put down, but the Han Dynasty is now on its last breath. 189 AD, a 14 year old Liu Bian becomes uh, the Emperor of China. General He Jin attempts to seize power by ordering assassin Dong Zhuo to kill the Emperor. The plan was leaked, and He Jin was killed. In September of 189 AD, Dong Zhuo would raid the capital and claim himself to be the Emperor. In the following year, official Yuan Shao forms an alliance with over a dozen territories in order to fight Dong Zhuo. Dong Zhuo takes the child emperor and leaves for the city of Chang'an. The capital of Luoyang is burned to the ground, displacing millions of civilians. This situation angered a man named Situ. In 192 AD, he ordered the legendary Three Kingdom warrior Lu Bu to kill Dong Zhuo. Lu Bu would decapitate Dong Zhuo. China falls into chaos once again. Elsewhere, in 195 AD, a general named Cao Cao comes to the capital and moves the emperor to his base in Xuxian. He made the emperor a puppet while consolidating power for himself in the north and central China. The kingdom of Wei is established. Also around this time, Liu Bei, with his own ambitions of ruling China one day, recruits a military genius Zhuge Liang, along with uh, the help of uh, his best friends Guan Yu and Zhang Fei. He took the three best friends' uh, three visits to Zhuge Liang's house finally convince him to join uh, Liu Bei's forces. And from there, the Shu Kingdom is formed. Let's talk about the famous battle at the Red Cliffs. It is the year of uh, 208 AD. Cao Cao marches south with the goal of unifying China once and for all. Liu Bei sees the threat from Cao Cao and forms an alliance with Sun Quan in order to hold off uh, the invasion. Cao Cao arrives at the Red Cliffs in the Hubei province. Cao Cao's armies uh, lacked combat experience in the water, and uh, many were extremely seasick. So, Cao Cao ordered all ships to be tied together by using metal chains in order to ease the motion sickness. This was a huge mistake. General Huang Gai, he saw this fatal mistake, and he came up with a plan in order to take down Cao Cao's forces. So he faked a surrender to uh, Cao Cao, and sailed against the wind with 10 ships. As he approached uh, Cao Cao's ships, he lit up his ship, which were all filled with haze and branches. All were uh, extremely flammable, and all 10 of his ships were instantly set ablaze. The fire would spread rapidly, engulfing all of Cao Cao's forces. The Sun Liu alliance would cross the Yangtze River and completely crush Cao Cao's forces. Cao Cao would never have another chance to cross the Yangtze River to invade southern China. The three kingdoms are now locked in place. In 220 AD, Cao Cao passes away after killing the miracle doctor Hua Tuo that once treated his illness. His son Cao Pi became the king of Wei. Other kingdoms would copy this move. In 221 AD, Liu Bei claims himself the king of Shu. In 222 AD, Sun Quan claims himself the king of Wu. So we have the kingdom of Wei, the kingdom of Shu, and the kingdom of Wu. Three kingdoms, three kings. Things uh, would get pretty insane during this era, but uh, that's for a different video. More on the uh, romance of the Three Kingdoms in later videos. Many more minor battles would ensue, with uh, none of the three sides able to break the deadlock. Let's fast forward uh, to uh, the year of 263 AD. A man named uh, Sima Zhao defeats the kingdom of Shu, becoming the king of Jin. In 265 AD, Sima Zhao passes away. His son Sima Yan decapitates the king of Wei in the north. In 279 AD, Sima Yan leads over 200,000 troops to attack the Wu Kingdom. They will run into many hurdles along the way while attempting to cross the Yangtze River, with many troops forced to use uh, life rafts or simply swim across the river. Eventually, in March of 280 AD, the Jin forces would take down Wu. 96 years after the Yellow Turban Rebellion that sent China into a chaos and frenzy, China is finally once again reunited under the Jin Dynasty by the Sima family.